Hey guys, welcome back to the Max Spence Business Podcast. Today, I have a very special guest. But before I jump into that, if you guys have got any value from the content I've been putting out, you know, the people I'm interviewing, uh, you know, please like, subscribe, leave, leave a review. It helps out a ton with the podcast. If you can't over, go, go over to Apple Podcasts and leave a review, that helps out a ton as well. If you're watching on YouTube, please subscribe, you know, absolutely crush the, the like and uh, hit the notification bell because all that stuff helps out a a tremendous amount with the YouTube al algorithm. Anyway, so going into today's podcast, uh, today's guest is Matthew O'Brien. So he's the founder and editor of 4PM. So 4PM is a daily newsletter focused on all things cannabis in North America. They provide pretty much industry leading analysis and, you know, interviews with top cannabis leaders. It's great having you on the show, Matthew. No, thank you very much for the invitation, Max. Awesome. Awesome. So why don't we jump into, uh, you know, for people that maybe haven't come across your content before, I know you have, uh, I believe you have got over 14,000 on LinkedIn. You've got like, you know, you, you got, uh, you know, a, a, a decent brand on LinkedIn around the cannabis space. Um, why don't we sort of take it from the beginning? You know, how did you get into, uh, you know, the cannabis space and, uh, you know, and then, you know, moving over to the North American market? Yeah, so for me, my, my journey into the industry started off reading a book called Narconomics, which lays out a pretty pragmatic argument as to why we as a society effectively need to legalize all drugs. And what I appreciated most about this book in particular is that it wasn't trying to make a moral argument as regards, you know, the moral implications of the continuation of the war on drugs, you know, which I, I guess could be a very strong argument in the sense that it does disproportionately target minority communities, people of color. But this book in particular just laid out the argument to end the war on drugs from a very economic standpoint. And it just laid out the fact that at the end of the day, you know, criminal organizations need to pay their people. And in order to pay their people, they need to generate profits first and foremost. And the current channel which they actually use to generate these profits is the, the illicit substance market. So whether that's cannabis, whether that's, you know, any array of substance, methamphetamines, you know, cocaine, it's a, it's a long, long list. And what I just appreciate about the book was that it was a very sound argument from the standpoint of economic principles. And I just came and go with this idea that we were effectively being thought that, you know, all drugs are dangerous when in actuality, you know, drugs play a huge part in our daily lives, whether that's the consumption of products that have high, you know, sugar content, whether that's products that have, you know, very high caffeine content. And we were always thought that like drugs are bad, but in reality, it was very much a double standard whereby we had sought to highlight that a certain sort of classification of substances were bad and were good. Whereas in reality, it was quite clear that the, the bad and good terminology was very much misguided in the sense that, you know, alcohol is the, I guess, number one uh, consumed recreational substance. And from a legislative standpoint, like it, it's very clear that that substance in particular is actually one of the most dangerous, if not the most dangerous. Whereas contrary to that, cannabis as a product is something which we as a species have been consuming for thousands of years. There has never been a known fatality associated with the consumption of cannabis. And, and with that, I just became very curious as to what the world would inevitably look like at the point in time which we decided to take a more common sense approach to, to cannabis and more broadly just substances in general. So with that, decided to move to North America when I was 19 years old and started off in the, the industry working as a bud tender. Eventually worked my way up to, to managing stores, started managing supply chains, spent a bit of time thereafter working on the software side of cannabis, and then most recently working on 4PM, which is really just a, a media company for cannabis professionals more specifically. I actually like the, the topic that you brought up there was uh, with like the legalization of drugs and like, uh, you know, how the governments are going around it. Right. And, and I, and I sort of agree with you is like, um, I think the majority of drugs should be regulated because if they're regulated, then they can be better controlled instead of just being, um, you know, just being sort of blocked. And, you know, there's like, because pe pe like, to be honest, like people, people are still going to use drugs. Like at the end of the day, people are still going to use them. Right. But I mean, if they're able to get something that's actually not laced with something that's even more deadly, um, that can actually kill them or, you know, doesn't like, you know, for the certain dosage amounts, um, you know, it's like either more potent or whatever. Right. Um, mm -hmm. you know, like that, that, that's going to be that I, I believe that's going to be better for the pe like people's health and stuff. Like, yeah, pe people shouldn't use drugs, but I mean, people are still going to use drugs at the end of the day. People are still going to drink. People are still going to eat fast food. It's just, you know, <laughs> it's, it's just part, it's just part of being human. Right. Uh, but th that, that's actually super interesting. What, what, what book was that again? 
It's called uh, Narconomics. I'll see if I can get the author of that book when we're actually on the call. But um, highly recommend it to anyone and everyone in the sense that it's it's definitely the book that has, I guess, most strongly influenced my perspective on just the world around us. The, the name of that author is, do, 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 I believe it's Tom, Tom Wainwright is the name of the author of that book. And I said, highly recommend it to, to anyone and everyone who's interested in the industry. I think it's a, I think it's a very good starting point to approach the industry from. Like there's a lot of people who are still struggling to understand the industry and probably for good reason, because like cannabis is by nature, like one of the most complex substances known to man. It's such a multitude of molecules that are present in the product. But um, I, as a starting point for someone who's sort of seeking to understand like why is legalization happening at the rapid rate, which it is, I think that's a must read for anyone. Yeah, 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 a hundred percent. It se- it seems like it's a, a very a very knowledgeable book. Um, so n- now now sort of moving to uh, w- when you came to uh, Canada and, and joined the sort of cannabis industry, uh, I-, I believe you, you yeah like like you were saying you joined in twenty seventeen um, and uh, at, at that time like uh, cannabis wasn't legalized. So h- how was that working in an industry that like that must have been uh, it must have been in- very interesting to say the least. Yeah, for sure, for sure. Um, a lot of good, a lot of bad. A lot of good in the sense that at the time, there was definitely a risk factor. And that risk factor has attracted a certain sort of profile um, of people in that a lot of the people who were involved in the industry in the earliest days, they weren't in it for the sort of financial opportunities that have become more and more clear as, as time goes by. A lot of them were just in the industry because they felt that, you know, we have the right to have access to these products. And that the current prohibition was unjust and the way in which they were going to sort of undo that was civil disobedience in the sense that they were going to openly consume the products if the police wanted to arrest them, so be it. But they wanted to make it abundantly clear that this was the utmost waste of resources. So in the early days, you know, very interesting in that a lot of the people were extremely passionate about it. At the same time, I would say there was a lot of people in the industry at that point in time who sort of capitalized on that particular point in particular in the sense that knowing that a lot of people were in the industry just as a, as a result of their passion for the plant, they sought to you know not have the best employment practices in place, knowing that a lot of the people would stay around just because they wanted to be in the industry, just so that they could be in the industry, not so much for the, the paycheck which they received at the end of the month. So uh, definitely a very interesting time. I feel like I got sort of exposure to the best version of the cannabis industry and the worst at the same time. Best in the sense that from a supply chain standpoint, very much a sort of laissez-faire supply chain. Like we had, you know, relationships with a multitude of suppliers, some craft growers from Ontario, some craft growers from, you know, the Okanagan. Worst in the sense that there wasn't any regulations in place such that a lot of the people who were working in the industry at that time were definitely sort of taken advantage of in the sense that they were being vastly undercompensated. A lot of the people who were operating the stores at these times just did not have the sort of managerial background that is required to sort of create that good work environment per se. So a brilliant experience wouldn't have traded it for the world, despite the fact that there was a lot of ups and downs during that time period. But um, yeah, all, all in all, you know, as I said, a fantastic experience. I would definitely do it again, but it would not be for the faint hearted. Yeah. Yeah. No, a hundred percent with that. Um, yeah. So like, I, I remember hearing, um, like if, if, if you, um, so as a bud tender, like if, if the police like raided your location, I, I don't know if this is true. Uh, but if the police raided your location, you, if, as you are the bud tender, you would get actually get slapped with a fine or the right. jail time and the, and the owner who wasn't on site wouldn't get a, any like ramification for that. It, 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 was that true? I think it all depends on the province which you're in. So each, each province sort of had their own policy as it pertained to cannabis at that time. In Ontario, they were very much seeking to disincentivize any sort of normal personnel, not normal in the sense that like you're not coming in with, you're not investing capital in the space, you're not operating a store, normal in the sense that like you're just a, a bud tender, perhaps an assistant store manager, or maybe even a store manager. So the way which they sought to disincentivize those people from actually working for the individuals who were operating these businesses is that they, they specifically targeted those individuals from a criminalization standpoint. Yes, there was fines. Yes, there was, you know, in, in certain incidences, criminal records uh, dished out to those individuals. In British Columbia in particular, we were very fortunate in the sense that the municipality of Vancouver and Victoria had a certain level of foresight to identify that 
legalization was going to happen within a very short period of time. Uh, and they sought to license a certain number of stores ahead of time, such that when legalization did come into effect, they could effectively streamline the process because they already had gone through the licensing process with a select number of stores. So for me, as an immigrant and an individual who was on a visa, which would have resulted in myself being deported had I worked in a store in Ontario, if the store had been raided, I decided to work in British Columbia such that it just offered a little bit more security. Like if the store did get raided, it would only be raided by virtue of working in a store that hadn't received one of those licenses. So for myself, it was really just about finding employment in one of the few stores in Vancouver who did have the municipal license at the time. Yeah, yeah, that, that, that that's actually crazy. Um, that like, uh, well, that that that's actually crazy to sort sort of like live live in that sort of environment where where like the possibility of being deported for, you know, like now now I sort of think about it is like ever weeds become sort of like uh almost you know is, is sort of become the same as is alcohol now right it's like it would be similar to like let's say somebody going like in ontario somebody going into like the police going into the lcbo and you know finding one of the keepers there or something like that it would be crazy right. um but yeah like I, i'm actually happy that vancouver had sort of some of the foresight to sort of like be like hey you know like you know how, how the how culture is moving and you know how the general like populations is sort of outlook on this sort of industry is changing uh we're actually going to start you know um giving out some you know like uh registrations for the shops right uh so how how did that change once uh once the legalization came into effect it was interesting because right now in Canada, we have far too much product and not enough people who are seeking to consume that product or, or purchase that product rather. My understanding is that right now there is 10x the supply than there is demand of legal cannabis products in the Canadian market. Whereas the opposite was true in the early days. And the opposite was true to such an extent that the uh, premier of uh, British Columbia, John, John Hogan, I believe was the name of the individual at the time, decided that they were actually going to limit the number of stores who could transition to the legal market, such that on day one of legalization in BC, there was actually only one store that was open in, in Kamloops, I believe, was the location. And what that meant for the stores which I was working at was that there simply wasn't enough supply of products available for them to transition their stores into the legal market. And effectively, what that created is this sort of uncertainty as to whether these stores were actually operating within the sort of confines of the law, the law as, the, as was defined by the, the province as opposed to the, uh, the nation of Canada. The nation of Canada said pretty explicitly from day one, any stores who are operating in the illicit market should, put, should, show, should close their doors. Whereas the municipalities were a little bit more, I, I guess there was a little bit more uh, room for sort of taking their time with that transitionary period. But in the end, what happened with the stores I was working at is that they seemingly just took advantage of the fact that there was that uncertainty. And even at the point which there was enough products available to transition into the legal market, because the margins which they would have otherwise generated from the products in the legal market were such were, were, were so substantially less versus that of the profit margins they were accustomed to in the illicit market, they actually intentionally delayed the process of transitioning into the market, which ultimately was, was part and parcel of what led me to move away from that company. Um, at the time, I think it was about six months after legalization had occurred. So a crazy period of time. In fact, I would probably go as far as to say that like the the ups and downs of that period, you know, far, far exceeded that of the the months prior, even when we were still operating in a fully illicit market. Mm -hmm. But um a, a very, very, very interesting period nonetheless. Um, but I I'd say the company I worked for, you know, in hindsight, they would have been very wise to have transitioned to the legal market. And I I know from having had conversations with some of the the leadership personnel at that company, they, they, they do deeply regret not moving faster to license their stores. But, you know, we, we all have 2020 vision in, a, in retrospect. Yeah, 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 yeah. So right now, uh, like, like what you were saying was, um, you know, there's a huge oversupply. Like I remember the early days of when it sort of got legalized and everybody was talking about, like, I remember, I, I think it was like Doug Ford, like the Ontar Ontario premier uh, talking about the stores and like how there was such a shortage of like, you know, to, to get cannabis into Ontario mm -hmm. and stuff. Um, yeah. T talking about uh, the oversupply right now. Um, what, how is that currently affecting the market, right? Like uh, with with companies and also investments in like the, the public mar market of like, you know, canopy growth and other, you know, prominent players in the cannabis industry. 
I think we're doing at this point in time that Canopy Growth as a company would effectively be bankrupt if not for the investment they receive from Constellation Brands. Now, to sort of dissect that statement, maybe they wouldn't have been as aggressive with their M&A activity if not for the fact that they received that funding, but something tells me they probably would have been as aggressive and without the treasure trove of treasure trove of capital, which they obtained from that investment from Constellation Brands, they, they would effectively have been bankrupt. And you know, if you look at Aurora Cannabis, a company which hasn't been all that fortunate to have received that level of investment from an alcoholic, an alcoholic beverage company or even a tobacco company, which has kind of become a, a common practice of late, there's a lot of companies that are going to go out of business. And it's under the unfortunate reality of the situation we find ourselves in is that like it, you don't have to be a mathematician to identify the fact that there is simply too much product and too few consumers. And the byproduct of that is that many of the companies who are producing that product are going to go bankrupt. And that has to happen sooner rather than later. What's happening right now is that there's a lot of price compression occurring to the point which my understanding is that um, from the period of, I think it was Q1 to Q2, or maybe, sorry, it was, it was Q3 to Q4 of 2020, the average price per gram of cannabis sold on the Ontario Cannabis Store, which is the um, e-commerce monopoly the province of Ontario have in that province in particular, declined by about 30% which is massive, which is humongous, yeah. in fact, for, for, any, for any producer who is operating off such slim margins, for your margins to decline by that percentile is, is very concerning. If, if anything, it's a sort of an existential threat to your, your very existence. So the combination of those factors is going to result in what I would estimate, you know, somewhere between 80 to 90% of producers going out of business within the next two years. I think there's going to be a lot of consolidation. It's something we're already seeing already. You know, Hexo just announced the uh, acquisition of Xenobus, and I think they're now pursuing the acquisition of 48 North. I am not someone who comes from a corporate background, so I do at the best of times fail to understand the sort of synergies which are created by virtue of those acquisitions in the sense that like Hexo themselves are producing too much product. Therefore, why would you add on existing? Why, why would you bring additional product capacity into your business when you know yourself that you're already producing too much product. It seems like they're just adding to the problem as opposed to actually seeking solutions, which is to you know, increase the demand for their products. And at the same time, like this approach of you know, adding new brands to your portfolio, I also think is a horrible strategy because if you look down south and if you look at the top brands which are dominating the market down there and Cookie is probably top of mind for many, they only have one brand. Like they, they literally have a brand, it's Cookies. Whereas if you look at most Canadian producers, it seems like they seek to solve any problem with the additional creation of a brand, which to me simply adds additional problems to the existing problems they have, which further expedites the process of them actually going out of business. So all that to say, the way this is going to play out is that 90% of producers are going to go out of business. It's unfortunate, but it has to happen. Wow. Wow. Yeah, that... That's uh, that's absolutely crazy. Like, yeah, and and so, sort of sort of from that point of view of like, you know, if if they're like they're adding supply to to the company and they're not dealing with the the demand problem, right? Where the like like you were just saying was, um, you, you know, how Canadian companies are adding adding another brand when they're not just bolstering and making better the brand they already have. Whereas cookies, like I, I, I uh, from actually a couple of your posts, I, I, I just uh, looked briefly into cookies and, and to be honest, I've never heard, uh, heard of them before, but I just looked into the, a little bit of the brand and what they're doing. And I was like, wow, these guys like with their marketing, they like it, it's done pretty well. Uh, so what, uh, what companies are you sort of really interested in and you think are going to survive sort of the, you know, like get over that 90% failure rate? I think it's going to be craft producers that are probably at the greatest advantage in the sense that they have implemented a pretty simple yet wildly effective strategy, which in retrospect is going to be glaringly obvious that it was the right approach, which is quality over quantity. In the early days of the industry, and this, this is sort of my two cents on what resulted in the situation we find ourselves in today, whereby supply exceeds demand by 10x. Every single company was being built for investors as opposed to for consumers. And what I mean by that is the reason as to why each and every company sought to substantially increase the supply of products that they were um, producing 
It was not because they thought there was going to be that level of demand. It was simply such that they could state in their you know, investor presentations that we're producing this quantity of cannabis there for, you know, apply this multiple based on the average price per gram. And this is the amount of money we're going to generate. And this is our valuation as a result of that. And every single company took that approach to the point which oblivious the fact that, you know, every single company was doing so. Therefore, to the point I made earlier in this conversation, you know, 90% of the companies implementing this approach were going to fail. On the opposite end of that spectrum, you had craft producers who evidently have decided to focus on small batch production. Now, they are charging a lot more for their products and they need to uh, by virtue of the fact that they are producing less, they, they have to charge more so that they can actually you know, generate enough profit to pay the people who are working for these companies. But all in all, I think craft producers stand a really good chance of success. I think companies who are specializing in value-added products, so like edibles, beverages, et cetera, I think they're going to be around for, for quite some time. My sort of two cents more broadly on the trends we're going to see play out in the Canadian market in the forthcoming years is that we're probably going to reach a cap pretty soon as to the number of consumers who are actually interested in the combustion of cannabis, i.e. dried flour. Whereas there is a huge untapped market of consumers who aren't interested in smoking cannabis to experience its effects, but they are interested in the effects, just not that form factor. So what we're likely going to see is beverages, you know, gradually, and probably it's going to be a slow process. They're going to start to increase the overall percentage of market share of consumers who are consuming those products. And that's not as a result of consumers changing from flour and dried flour. That's because they're going to be bringing new consumers online, consumers who otherwise would not have consumed cannabis. But because of this new form factor, they actually find it a lot more attractive. The same is going to be true for edibles. So overall, I think the, the value added company or value added um, producers, you know, maybe your trust beverages, probably a good example. Dynamo, I think is the name of the company. They're based in Alberta. They produce a lot of the edibles or a lot of the gummies for the Canadian market. I think they, sh- they stand a great chance at succeeding in the forthcoming years. But for a lot of the companies that are currently focused on dried flour and producing it in, in bulk, I think that their fate has largely been sealed. And regardless of what set of actions they take, the businesses are either going to get a lot smaller or they're going to be out of business full stop. Ah, okay. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. That, that, those are actually some really, really interesting insights. Like to, to be honest, like I, I, I know a tiny bit, like a, like, like a tiny amount about what's happening in the industry, but like just having you on the show for like the past 15 minutes, I'm like, I'm like, Holy crap. This is like, this is absolutely insane with like what's happening with the market, uh, the oversupply and all that other type of stuff. Like I, 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 I didn't even actually know it, like any of this stuff, like, you know, what was happening with like actually existed and stuff. Um, so I, I, I'm a bit of a nerd when it, when it comes to <laughs> cannabis. So, um, I'll, I'll apologize in advance. No, 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 no. I, I, <laughs> I, I, I absolutely love it. Like it's, it's it's so like um you you're very concise with your information um and you know you you articulate it really well which i love and it's like super easy to digest and understand so it's absolutely amazing um i I, and and that's probably why you're doing so well on linkedin right now uh and you're growing so fast is because you're you're so concise with like the message that you're putting out there um so actually moving over into that, uh, you know, starting uh, 4 p.m., um, you know, how, how did that come around? And uh, yeah, how, how, how did that sort of start? For sure, for sure. And to be honest with you, like I kind of give like many iterations of the story, which resulted in my creating 4 p.m. So here, here's a different version of events. And this is this is because largely speaking, you know, at the time, it wasn't really clear why I was starting the company as much as I thought it was just a really good idea for a sort of multitude of reasons. But at the core was largely my desire to build a network within the industry. So for myself, when I decided to step away from the company I was previously working at, I decided to pursue a software startup. And I still think the idea we were working on is probably going to be a billion dollar company someday, which, which you know, perhaps I, I'm biased because I worked on this, trying to solve this problem for as long as I did, but without going too far into the, the weeds, no pun intended, the realization I had pretty early on was that I did not have any one of a network in the industry. And the thing about our industry is that, albeit it's you know expanding at an incredibly rapid rate, there still is a very sort of tight-knit community that exists within cannabis. And if you can somehow become part of that, you, know, you gain access to this wealth of knowledge, which you otherwise wouldn't even have known existed in the first place. And for me, I just was really motivated, for lack of a better term, to, to gain access to that sort of 
wealth of information, which I knew was out there, but at the time I just didn't have. And similarly, I had an experience on LinkedIn whereby, you know, in the beginning, as we were working on this, this SAP application, and I started sending people messages, like not a lot of people were applying. And I didn't really understand that at the beginning, but it was only when I started creating content myself. And then I started to get, you know, a ridiculous amount of messages on a daily basis. I realized pretty quickly that everyone was sending messages on LinkedIn, asking people to review their pitch deck and, you know, look at the software I've built and look at the, you know, agency I've built. And, you know, do you want to jump on a coffee call for 30 minutes? And I, I realized that if I was going to be able to build a network, I had to have a pretty differentiated approach in how I was going to ask people for, for time. And I realized that I myself was very reluctant to agree to anyone to jump on a call with them just to have a conversation, just to shoot the shit. Whereas, Alternative to that, I was always taking people up on the offers they provided to appear on podcasts. And at the time, I was in Ireland. And at that particular time, the internet or the, the broadband connection in Ireland was, was awful to the point which I actually couldn't launch a podcast because while having the conversations, the, the, the calls were just cutting out. And it just came to a point in time whereby I realized it just wasn't, it wasn't a good use of my time. And it definitely wasn't a good use of the, the personnel's time who was on the other end of the call. So with that, I decided to build 4PM as a newsletter product, whereby I could simply just send the questions over text, receive the responses, and then decided to build that on top of Substack, which is a platform I, I recommend to everyone and anyone if you want to start your own newsletter. Literally an out-of-the-box solution, which allows you to create a newsletter overnight. And, and with, with access to that platform and having already built up like a bit of a personal brand on LinkedIn, and with my desire to sort of build a network I never had, that's very much where 4PM sort of came out of. So the way I like to describe 4PM to people is that it is the most selfish, selfless thing I do on a daily basis. Selfish in the sense that I get to have the conversations I want to have. Selfless in the sense that I then in turn share those conversations with anyone who is interested in, in reading that content. Yeah, yeah, that... that. <laughs> That's actually really funny that, 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 that you brought that up for, for the reason that you were wanting to uh, have conversations with industry leaders, um, you know, in, in cannabis, because uh, that's the exact same reason why I started my podcast was uh, previously in, in like 20, 2019 and early 2020, um, you know, I, I was I was trying to have conversation like I've always been very interested in business and I was just trying to have conversations with local business professionals in Ottawa <laughs> and uh, Ottawa, Ontario. And um it was like insanely hard to get a 15 minute meeting, a five minute coffee meet, like a five minute right. phone call, a 15 minute coffee meeting or anything, right? It was impossible. And then as soon as I started the podcast and said, Hey, do you want to come on my podcast? Hey, do you want to come on my <laughs> podcast? It changed from like, you know, asking, let's say, you know, like a, a 90% turndown rate to like, well, I'd probably say higher, like 95 to 98% of people saying, no, we're not even getting back to 80% mm. of people saying like, yeah, for sure. Yeah. Sh sh shoot me the details. Yeah. I'll, I'll come on. Right. The show. <laughs> and I was like, I, I was like, I was like, I was like, and, and in my, at the beginning, like, like you were saying, I, I didn't, I, I didn't really understand it. I was like, I was like, what, what's changed? Like, mm. I was like, even though this is a new show and, you know, there's barely any, like, you know, as starting a new show, there's barely any people watching this. Um, mm -hmm. I was, I was like, I was like, why are people like, I don't understand. Like, why are people saying yes now? And then I sort of realized is that like, even though like, you know, it's at like when I was starting the podcast, it, it was at the beginning, I was offering some form of value. So even at the 100%. end of the day, Right. It wasn't just like, hey, give me 15 minutes of your time or half an hour of your time and you get nothing back from it. At least, you know, at right. the end of the day, they have a piece of content that I can send to them and they can put on their own platform. Right. So, I mean, at the end of the day, they, they get, you know, a 45 minute uh, piece of content that they kind of can cut up into 10 clips or, you know, two clips or however many clips they want. And that, then that sort of clicked in like it was actually it's actually so funny that you brought that, that up because like that's the exact same reason I started this podcast was for selfish reasons. But then uh, to be selfless and, you know, being, being able to give like all these amazing conversations and the current conversation we're having right now uh, to people and to, you know, like uh, another reason why I started was um, to give people sort of my age and insight into different businesses and, you know, being able to taste and sort of, you know, when they're traveling through life and trying to figure out what they want to do with their life, being able to listen to a podcast and get a brief understanding of an industry to say, hey, you know, maybe that's interesting. Maybe I want to go, you know, down the cannabis sector and get into right. the cannabis industry. Or maybe, you know what, I, I listened to Matthew and, uh, you know, like running this newsletter and the conversations and I, and I love writing. So, you know, maybe I'll maybe I'll start a newsletter and all this other crazy stuff. Um, but yeah, uh, I, I, I want to sort of transition now to um, I, as, as you're someone um, as like you're one of the leading um, 
uh, you know, like influencers for can for cannabis on LinkedIn, which I was like, I was like, I was like, that's, that's pretty crazy. Cause like, you've only been like, you, I think you've only been running, um, uh, 4 PM for seven months now. Yeah. Actually it's less than that six months, but, six um, months, yeah. Detroit- so, sorry, what were you going to say? No, I was going to say, uh, to tell you the truth, it, it, it was never, it was never the intent to sort of get to where I am today in the sense that for me, it was always just like when, when, I, when I started and perhaps I'm like answering your question proactively, but um, correct, correct me if, if there's a different sort of angle you want to approach this from. But for me, when I started out, like it was very much just a case of like, I saw people who were getting like 20 likes, two comments on their posts. And all I would say to myself is, you know, if only I could get to the point in time whereby 20 people would like my post and two people would leave a comment, w- w- wouldn't that be what success would look like? And I just started looking at the people who were putting out content and I, I realized pretty quickly that like, there was a certain sort of format of content you'd put out, like images perform better, you know, certain images perform better, certain times of day perform better. I realized that, like, you know, you don't want to put too much text. You really got to tell it like a story. There has to be a start, a midpoint, an ending, a call to action. I realized I was like, this isn't actually as hard as I thought it was. And I, I guess that is the case with anything in life. Like once you know how to do something, it always seems easier in retrospect. But for me at the time, it was really just a case of, you know, I like I like sharing my my perspective. I would very much consider myself an introvert. Like at a conference, I'm not the person who isn't going to be going around talking to everyone. If anything, the opposite. Like I'll probably be like a bit of a recluse and, and keep to my own keep to my own corner. And you know, if someone comes by and they want to have a conversation, so be it. But what I liked about LinkedIn was that it kind of allowed me to be an extrovert while at the same time being an introvert. In the sense that I was able to communicate and share my my thoughts, my voice. What, you know, in, in some cases, like hundreds of thousands of people on certain posts, you know, more, more often than not, a lot less than that. And it allowed me to do so, you know, in the comfort of my own home. Like I could take as much time as I needed to sort of refine the thought, which I thought would be of value if I shared. And yeah, over time, I've just, you know, grown to love the platform. It's fantastic to see the cannabis community that's that's growing on the platform. And I'm, uh, I'm just glad to be a part of it. And like, for me personally, the biggest compliment I receive is that, other people have decided to start creating and sharing their perspectives or creating content and sharing their perspective on the platform as a result of the approach I've taken. And to me, that is the greatest compliment. Like I definitely have had a lot of business opportunities come about as a result of the work I've been doing on the platform. To me, that's all secondary. Like it's really a case of the, you know, the contribution we're making to the normalization of cannabis and like the, I guess the relationship to which people are coming out of the closet of cannabis and people are being a lot more vocal about their relationship with the plant and their, their work within the industry. And just to be able to play a small part in that is, is enough reason for me to get up every day with a smile on my face. And until such point as I feel any differently, you know, I'll continue to do what I love doing. Yeah. 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 Like that, like uh, j- just from hearing that, like, and, and sort of seeing your posts, like you, you've sort of mastered the, the, the written sort of side and picture side of LinkedIn where like, you know, like, like comparing that to like, let's say another influencer that sort of mastered the video side of let's say TikTok or YouTube and stuff. Like you, you, you've spent the time and you understand what performs well from testing and stuff. And, and I love that, that you said uh, you, like the, the greatest form of flattery that, that you get from it is like when people actually sort of copy your style a bit or sort of mimic you and, and like that it's the, old saying the I, I believe it's like you know like co- uh, like copying somebody is like the greatest form of flattery or, or something like that I, I, I don't know if I butchered that but um <laughs> but yeah like that, that, that that's absolutely amazing um and I, I know we only got a, a few more minutes left um so just to give a little bit more advice uh, to the listeners, um, let, let's say there, there's somebody who's like the majority of my demographic is 23 to 27, um, you know, and, and if they're listening right now and they're thinking about getting into the cannabis industry, let's say they're in university or something like that, or they're at a job, uh, what would your recommendation be to sort of get started and get their foot in the door in the cannabis industry? Yeah, I should say like, I, I, I myself, I'm only 23. So I, I was in conversations like people sort of, are of the perception of like 30 or, or 40 or something like that. Like I literally started in the industry when I was 19 and I'm very fortunate to have had the experiences I've had. And, you know, by virtue of having had the means to experience the illicit market, it really compressed a lot of the learnings I would otherwise have had to spend a lot more time obtaining. But the advice I'd offer to anyone who's sort of on the fence about, you know, joining the industry, I, I'd say go for it. Like the reality is that this industry is currently the smallest version of itself. And by smallest version of itself, I mean, you know, 98% of nations around the world currently maintain the prohibition of cannabis. In our lifetime, I suspect 
the percentage of nations who will have an adult use market for, for cannabis will be far in excess of 70%. So from our understanding, the upside of this industry is at least 10x from where we are today. And if you're, if you're someone my age and you kind of have like similar characteristics that I do, and you want to like travel across the world and you want to be able to, you know, acquire a skill set that has relevancy across multiple sort of geographic areas, while at the same time doing something you're actually interested in and an industry that does not have ageism. And that for me was a very important factor in the sense that like I was managing, you know, retail stores when I was 20 years old. There is no other industry which I'm aware of whereby a 20 year old, you know, immigrant from Ireland could have been managing, you know, 30 odd staff members at that age. And what it really comes back to is that the industry in its current form is in need of a lot of talented people because for a lot of the older demographic, they still have the sort of pre-existing stigma as to what they think cannabis is. Whereas in reality, you know, they are entirely wrong from where I'm standing as the fact that they think it's this dangerous product. That is the opportunity because a lot of these individuals you would otherwise be competing against in any other occupation but by virtue of their ignorance, you're afforded the opportunity to get in, to climb the ladder at a pretty rapid rate if you actually apply yourself to the industry. So if you have ambition, if you're interested in learning at an incredibly rapid rate and growing alongside this industry as it scales across the globe, there has never been a better time to join the industry. And I'd say if you're, if you're thinking about it, just jump in. And the worst that'll happen is you'll decide, you know, maybe six months down the road that it's not for you. But from... The majority of people I've spoken with who have ever been on the fence about jumping into the industry, I've always been told that the best decision they've made in a long period of time was deciding to join the cannabis industry. Yeah. Wow. Wow. Yeah. Uh, and, and I think I think that's that that's an absolutely amazing place to end it. And uh, yeah, I, I like just listening to that. Like that 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 is an immense account, like immense value in the fact that um the in like like you said ageism like the industry is based on your experience and your knowledge over just like how old you are right so if if, if right. you're willing to learn and you're willing like you're you're driven uh there's there's tons like from what you've told me there's tons and tons of value uh and opportunity in the cannabis industry but um yeah that, that, that that's absolutely phenomenal um yeah th thank you matthew for uh coming on the show it's it's been absolutely amazing uh where can people find out more about you know 4 p.m your newsletter also if they want to connect with you over linkedin and uh, you know maybe have a conversation or something where, where can they find all that info for sure for sure uh so linkedin is just matthew o'brien that's m-a-t-t-h-e-w uh o-b-r-i-e-n and then for 4 p.m., it's just forpm.co. And that's a, a daily newsletter that goes out uh, featuring interviews with some of the most prominent leaders in the, the North American industry, in addition to just industry analysis performed by myself. And then on Twitter, it's just M-A-T-T-H-E-W-O-B. If you want to connect with me on any of those platforms, I'm pretty responsive to any people who reach out. Awesome. Awesome. Well, thank you again, Matt, for uh, coming on the show. My pleasure. Thank you very much.